And uh, this right now, though, if we're being honest, in the next couple of days, it's kind of a contentious time. It's a divisive time. And so I was like, what can we do? What can we talk about to really just unite us all together? And so I figured the best thing is just to talk about religion and politics. So here, that's what we're going to do today. <laughs> Bring us all together, right? Um, but, you know, we've had some debates on the debate stage, but I remember a debate, it was back in, uh, I think, 2015 now, and it was the debate between the color of this dress that's up on the screen. Uh, I, I was convinced, actually, that's the second one. Can you show the other one there? So I was convinced, I looked at that picture many, many times, and I, I was just so convinced that this was a prank that everyone was playing, because the, the question was, is this a white and gold dress or a blue and black dress? And I was like, clearly, it's white and gold, and if you think anything else, you're just insane. You're just crazy. How, could it, it's, how can you look at that and not see white and gold? And I literally ever thought that there's like a hidden camera or a prank, something's going on, and you're just not in on it. I thought that's what was happening, because people online, oh, I see blue and black, and I'm like, well, you're crazy. And then I showed it to somebody, and they're like, I said, what color is this? And they said, blue and black. And I said, no, no, this picture right here, this one, what color is it? it and they said, blue and black. And I was so convinced that I was right. But turns out, you can show that next, the other picture there. It is, in fact, a blue and black dress. I, that is not the same dress in the other picture to me. I don't know about you guys. It does not look like that at all to me. But how many know sometimes the perception or the way that we see things can affect the reality that is before us? And see, objectively, that, that dress was blue and black, but I saw something different. And I think today that many people are putting their hope for our nation into who gets elected. And while that person will certainly influence the future of our country, I want you to know that God still very much holds his church and his people in his hand. That he's still in control. Amen? See, how we vote matters. I don't want to minimize this. How we vote matters. But how we vote does not matter most. Who's on the, on the throne matters most in our lives. And I want to reread what Cindy just read, and thank you for doing that. John 18. It says that Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. World. He says this again and again. He's repeating himself. He's trying to emphasize, my kingdom is not from this world. Verse 37, then Pilate, one of the leaders of that time, said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answers by saying, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray today that we would hear and see the truth for what it really is. God, that we would know your voice, that we would tune in to you, not our will or our ways, but your will be done in and through our lives, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to draw out three things that I think we see from these just couple of verses of scripture, and the first thing we see is Christ's clarification. If you're taking notes, number one, Christ's clarification. Jesus made it clear that his kingdom was not a political kingdom, but a spiritual one. And he's challenging the disciples, the followers, and the world's expectations in this statement. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And while Jesus seemed to repeatedly make this ultra clear, his enemies constantly seemed suspicious, and his disciples and his followers struggled to grasp if this was a real message or not. When Jesus was miraculously feeding the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, an amazing miracle, there was an immediate response to this miracle. It says this in John 6, verse 14 and 15. When the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, the miracle he had performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The people upon this miracle wanted to make Jesus king, but why? Why did they want to do that? Yes, because of the miracle. But there were conditions that brought about this longing. 
And that's important for us to understand. John the Baptist had just been executed. And some people saw this as, as a way, if they could put Jesus into this place of authority, he could, he could bring about some sort of retribution or right this injustice that had just happened. And beyond this particular instance with John the Baptist, Roman rule was particularly difficult for many in the crowd. They would have to pay high taxes, maybe what they felt like were unfair taxes, certainly tax collectors even skimming off the top and taking a little bit extra for themselves. They were frustrated. They felt the weight of political oppression as they were not a part of the, the special group or the elite class, and they were treated poorly because of it. And certainly there was a cultural clash in values and practices, and I'm not saying that we are under Roman rule, but you can probably see a level of similarity to our current climate and culture. And after the feeling of this for some time had gone on, the fatigue had set in, and they saw this man, Jesus, perform this miracle, and they said, we want him to be in charge, but maybe not wholly for the right reason. Because I think they didn't just want him to be in charge because he did a cool miracle. I think actually they wanted him to be in charge because they wanted some immediate relief. You might say, okay, that's the crowd though. Surely his close disciples, the 12 that walked with him every day, they would know what Jesus was here for. In fact, Jesus tells them, Matthew chapter 16, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Like, I don't know more, how much more plain he could have made it. But Peter, arguably the closest disciple, says to Jesus, takes him aside, rebukes him, and says, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus, watch this, turns to him and says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but watch this, but merely human concerns. In the midst of all that is going on in our political world, we must not get just simply concerned with the human aspect of it. We must remember that there is a spiritual element to it. Jesus' mission was paramount. It's why he came, to seek and to save those who were lost, to redeem and to set free. But this could not be done with the method the crowd desperately wanted. And it could not be done by the way that Peter wanted to do it, by protecting Jesus from anything that would be bad. Jesus knew that his mission required death. But he also offers some direction to us in the following verses. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. One of the great mysteries of following Jesus. He's clarifying, though, his purpose, and in doing so, he's redirecting us as well. Surely there are times when we wish that Jesus would just return, and he would rule with an iron fist, that he would right every wrong, that he would deal with all the injustice, he would deal with all the suffering, and all the pain, and all the evil that is in the world. We, we want that. Yet he allows us, for whatever reason, to remain in this brokenness, at least for the here and now. Not so that we can get all that we want, but to deny self and to learn to take up our cross and follow him. And in doing so, we learn to lose our life, to lose our selfish wants and desires, but the beauty of it is that we find real life, real freedom in Christ by sur surrendering and submitting to him. When the disciples inevitably wandered off course from their mission, Jesus constantly would pull them back in. And we, as we head into this election this week, must not lose sight of the big picture. And so that's why I want to frame it this way as we begin. The desire for a king is good, but make sure you're desiring the right king. But herein lies the struggle that we face because we also learn, we got to learn how to live in a tension. Number two, live in a tension. We wrestle with politics because we're trying to impose a kingdom culture onto a broken world. This leads us to a tension between our earthly desires and our heavenly calling. You go back to that, that first portion of scripture, what did Jesus say? If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. He said, I, if I wanted to rally the troops, if I wanted to gather the people, I could do it. 
But that's not why I'm here. He says, but my kingdom is not from this world. There's an important truth to hold on to in this tension, and it's this. There's no political savior. And you might say, well, of course, I don't believe there's a political savior, right? But if we were to evaluate where you spend your time, energy, and focus, would it look as if you're looking for a political one or the one that died 2,000 years ago? That's the question we have to be real with and really ask ourselves. And then the question moves from that to this. How do I live in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile towards the gospel? And I don't think there's really any question of that today. Paul writes this in Philippians 1.27. Whatever happens. So, just want to start here for a sec- stop here for a second. So, if Donald Trump gets elected, if Kamala Harris gets elected, if this bill passes, that bill passes, this person, that person, whatever happens, just to be ultra clear here, Paul says, not conditioned, everyone say whatever. <laughs> whatever happens. Some of you are looking over at your neighbor. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Sometimes I think that we as humans believe that if our circumstances were more convenient, then we would be more faithful. I don't think that's true. We say things like, if I had more time, then I'd be involved or I'd serve. If I had more money, then I'd give. If I had better friends, then I'd be more connected. If I had a better boss, then I'd work hard. I don't think faith is meant to be predicated on our circumstances. Faith is to be predicated on who he is. Amen? More often than not, it is actually pressure, by the way, that makes us stronger and better, not comfort. I know none of us want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. But Paul seems to be suggesting to the church here that no matter what is happening around us, we can choose to live rightly. And as he says, to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. But this manner worthy of the gospel also suggests that there's a manner unworthy of the gospel. And I just want to differentiate those two things in the political landscape for a moment. A manner worthy of the gospel would look like this. It would be demonstrating love to those who are voting differently than you, 1 John 4, 7. It would be serving others through acts of kindness and generosity regardless of one's political affiliation, Galatians 5, 13. It would be promoting unity by encouraging and collaborating among believers despite their political views, Ephesians 4.3. It would be respecting authority by praying for political leaders while standing firm in your biblical convictions. I'm not asking you to compromise, Romans 13. It would be being an advocate, advocate for godly change. So yes, use your life, use your voice to advocate for godly change. That's living in a manner worthy of the gospel. Let me tell you what's a manner unworthy of the gospel. Engaging in divisive speech by using harsh language or insults when discussing opposing political views, Ephesians 4. Promoting hatred by allowing anger towards individuals or groups because of their political beliefs, 1 John 2.9. Being unforgiving by holding on to grudges against those who support different political candidates, Matthew 6. Turning a blind eye to hateful speech or misuse of power. Complacency in action by remaining passive in the face of injustice while waiting for political change. We don't have the luxury of just being silent. Placing more emphasis and time on politics than in personal growth in your faith. That would be living in a manner unworthy of the gospel. Our theme verse for this year is Romans 12, 1 and 2. But verse 2 says this, do not conform. Do not be like. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let God transform you in a manner that leads you to live worthy of the gospel, worthy of the calling of God on your life. In the midst of discerning what is right politically, don't lose sight of your primary call spiritually. Instead, let God guide you in the tension, not away from the tension. But let's get down to the brass tacks. What does this mean for us? Number three, if you're taking notes, this is where I want to spend most of our time today. Voting with a kingdom mindset. We are called to vote with a kingdom mindset. I think one of the greatest battles that we face as followers of Jesus in America is that we live in this increasingly polarized culture, right? Where often multiple candidates have obvious shortcomings. Whether it's a long list of transgressions, things that have been said or done by one person or another. 
or its abhorrent character or opposing values that we, we might hold to. We see the flaws of broken people, but I just want to say this. We too are broken people. And you might say, well, I'm not as bad as that person. I'm not as bad as that person. But I would say here that no one's willing to stand up, come up to the front, and just admit all the sins in your life. Anyone? Any, anyone on us? Yeah? No? No takers? Okay, yeah. That's what I thought. We all got our junk, right? We all got our stuff. We live in a broken world. And maybe some of you think no option seems ideal, so what do I do? You're asking yourself, what do I do? This is where I think it, it, it's important to have a kingdom mindset. The mindset isn't about me, but it's about him. It's not about preservation, holding on to all that I have. It's not about going out and getting all that I can get for myself, but it's one that puts Christ at the forefront. What's best? What does he want? What's his will? His kingdom come. His will be done. This requires wisdom, though. James 1.5 tells us this, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be, and it will be given to him. As we pray for wisdom, God reveals to us. In fact, God through scripture reveals to us. Micah 6, 8 says this, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. When laying this reality on the political landscape, we, knew, we realize we need three things. Our vote should further justice, it should further mercy, and it should further humility. It should further justice, mercy, and humility. This is really, really important that we understand this. And I'm not just meaning justice by the sense that sometimes we mean it, because often what we mean is vengeance when we say justice. And listen, God will avenge what he needs to avenge, but he's also a merciful and gracious God. So I'm talking about biblical justice, biblical humility, biblical mercy. We don't have time to go through everything today, but I do think there are some areas that we need clarity on. And as I share some of this, some of you are, I'm going to be honest, this many people in the room, some of you are going to disagree with me. And that's okay, all right? We can still love each other. But here's what I have to live with. God's called me to lead you as a church. God's called Pastor Ron to lead you as a church. And one day, while I'm standing before you now, one day I'm going to stand before God. And that concerns me a lot more than this moment right here. And so I need to be able to give an account that I shared the truth before you, that I rightfully equipped you with what Scripture says. And so I'm leaning heavily on Scripture today, as you'll see. But let's talk first about character and integrity. And I want to read a few verses from Proverbs 29, because you'll see how character and integrity are so important, and the lack thereof also have consequence. He says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. The king, by judgment, establishes the land, but he that receives gifts over, overthrows it. And it goes on in the last one in verse 12. If a ruler listens to lies, all his officials will become wicked. Now, some of you are saying, okay, Ray, character and integrity. Got it. I understand that we should be voting for somebody with godly character and integrity. But what if that person doesn't exist? Or what if we feel like no one fully embodies this? Then now what do we do? This is where you begin to move just, not just looking at the person, but also looking at the policy. And this is really important. So what has that person done? What are they saying they're going to do? And what will be the outcomes of those policies? Will they lead us closer to God? And by the way, if you say, well, I don't, we're, you know, we're a democracy or you, however you want to frame the, the, the saying who we are as a country, and you say, well, I don't think, you know, God should be in all that. Here's the thing. Do you believe that God's ways are the best? If you believe that God's ways are the best, then should we not look to honor God? Because that will be the best blessing for our country. That's the logic I would just walk you through there. All right? But we want to look at those policies. Let's be honest. No candidate is perfect. And maybe this year you feel like that's even less so than other years. Many are deeply flawed at every stage of government. Why? Because, again, it's comprised of people. So how do we choose amongst less than ideal, can, uh, ideal situations? Some of you, uh, at, at hearing all this or thinking through all this over the last couple of months, maybe you're disillusioned and you think there's no choice and you just want to wipe your hands clean and say, you know what? I'm going to just step right up here and I'm going to be above the fray. Like, I, I don't, I'm not going to participate, get down in the dirt and all that stuff. Here's what I would say to you. I think the issues are too important to be silent on. I think 
that if we allow the church to be silent, that the world's going to fill that void. And this is an opportunity for us to speak. And so I just want to talk primarily today about the issue of identity, because I believe that important issues revolve around this. Understanding our identity, who we are in Christ. Listen, if you don't know who God is, you won't know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you will not value the people around you the way that you need to. And it's going to be very difficult to actually have a kingdom mindset. So let's talk a little bit about that and, and how identity, because we're going to say things like, okay, we're going to look at like sexuality and we say, well, God created two genders, a man and a woman, you know, and all this stuff. And that's true. But we are really, what we're really doing is we're dealing with a symptom. You know what the root is? It's identity. And so we got to dig down to kind of figure some of this stuff out. We see much confusion in the world because we simply lack a biblical understanding. You know, Barna is a popular re Christian research group, and they did a study a while back, and they said that, uh, I want you to just think about how many people under the age of 30 have a biblical worldview based upon their series of questions. They said 1%. Now, if you want to be generous and say some of those questions could go a different way, let's say 10%. Still not very many. And if you think, oh, that's because it's the young people, surely those who are a little bit older, 50 to 64, 5%. It's not very high. The amount of people who read their Bible consistently, not very high. We just, we don't know scripture well enough. And so some of the stuff I'm going to introduce, you're going to say, I've never heard that before. All right. I didn't know that was there. That's okay. Just, I would encourage you be open and ask the Holy Spirit to receive what he has you to receive today. Let me read from Amos chapter eight as Lisa comes up today. Uh, by the way, Amos was a farmer, if you don't know, and he was not really a prophet, although he was a prophet. He was not like a, a prophet by, by trade. It's not something that he had, he had gone along. He was a farmer. He was just kind of an average guy. And God used him, and he took him to the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel was, was prosperous in this time. They were really pretty well off. And I'm not saying, that, again, that we're in the exact same situation. I don't want to put ourselves into the text, but I, I do think there are some similarities that we can see here. And Amos said this, The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. But this is not a famine of food, it's not a drought or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. What did he mean? See, I believe that we're living in an hour where, sadly, the Word of God has been so compromised by so many, so spun, so twisted to get it to say what we want it to say, that it's confused many people. A time where the Bible is readily available, but truth seems difficult to discover. So what I'm about to say about the sanctity of life for a moment might seem foreign to you, but it is pulled straight from Scripture. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Before you were born. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know them full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I don't know how you read verses like this and others in scripture and come to any other conclusion other than this, that God has a plan for us. And not just a plan once we are born, but before we were ever born, while we were in our mother's womb. And I want to be abundantly clear because I think sometimes we don't know what to, to really how to read or interpret things because we don't say it clearly. I believe that what has happened through abortion in America breaks the heart of God. And while I think that there are some who have wrestled with this decision, I want to speak to you in a moment. I do think there is a camp and a group out there that believes abortion is really not that big of a deal. That we have framed it in many different ways, whether it's pro-choice or a woman's rights. And what's happened that God's heart was upon it in all these lives that he had ordained plans for that we have cut off. I believe that it's honestly evil being disguised as good. The Bible says, woe to those who call good evil and 
evil good. When God puts a woe before something, it better stop us in our tracks. I believe that this is happening, and it's a wicked scheme of the enemy. John 10.10 10 says that he came to steal, kill, and destroy. What's he, what are we talking about? What's he trying to kill? He's trying to snuff out the plan in the ways of God. And you see this happen in Scripture, whether it was the killing of Hebrew babies in Egypt in the Old Testament, or Herod killing all the children under the age of two in Bethlehem. The, God, or the enemy tries to snuff that out in its infancy. But just as I mentioned, the decision for some of you, maybe you've had an abortion and you're in this room, or you wrestled with this before, and that decision, decision was incredibly difficult because you didn't want to do it, but you felt like you had no choice. Maybe it was because of how you were brought up in the society, or maybe it was because of economics and finances. Or maybe if we can just be real church, did they feel like they could walk into a church where maybe they weren't married and they were pregnant and that no eyes would look upon them with judgment? Could we look at ourselves today for a moment before we cast all the stones and say all the things and all the reasons that people are doing these things? Could we say we could actually be a part of the solution? I want you to know if you've ever gone through that Romans 8.1 there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That there is freedom. There is forgiveness in Jesus. That you don't have to beat yourself up because of what has happened but God has come to set you free and he loves you so much no matter what any of us have done. And we as a church must step in and we must support those who are going through difficult times. Support agencies like Pregnancy Care Center that come alongside expectant moms and help them go through pregnancy and beyond to give them resources for the child. That come along fathers and, and say, we want you to be a part of this process as well. That offer adoption services for those who need it. And that's why we actually financially support them as a church. And I know many of you even go be above and beyond that. Because we don't want people to feel like they're alone in this. But I want to add to this idea of sanctity of life because often that means abortion, but it's so much more than that. Sanctity literally means holy. And we believe that each person is made in the image of God, as Genesis tells us. And that's why we treat people beyond birth incredibly well as well. Proverbs 31, verse 8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of of all those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. I gotta be honest with you. I think the big C church, I'm not necessarily just saying our church, but the big C church sometimes misses this. We want to be incredibly compassionate for everybody, regardless of the stage of life that they find themselves in, especially for those who are poor and needy. We have opportunity to serve them. And we can mistakenly assume, though, that people are in this place because they're taking advantage of the system or they did something wrong, that they made some bad choices, but that's just not always the case. And listen, even if it was, I don't know about you, but I've made some pretty stupid decisions in my life. Don't look at the person next to you right now. When we participate in serving our community through a mission suite or different events throughout the year, we don't walk into those spaces and hold judgment over the people that we're serving. We're there to help them with a heart that wants to bring hope to them. We treat them with dignity and respect. We treat them as a peer and a person. And by the way, that's why social media sometimes just stinks. Because we forget that it's another person on the other side of that keyboard. I'm grateful that we have many here who care so much about these issues. Many who serve and go above and beyond. Because that's what it looks like to be the body of Christ. That's what it looks like to have a kingdom mindset. Bottom line, we value life no matter the stage that people are at because everyone is created in God's image and he loves and cares for us all. I want to close with this, and I know I'm a little bit long today. But I believe that while God has not called us to speak primarily about politics, he has called us to speak. First and foremost, to speak truth, right? That's what Jesus said. And while we are here to do that with love and grace, this hour, I believe, requires us to use our voices. Too long have we been silent, and I get it. Because to be silent sometimes is just to be able to say, I absolve myself of everything, and no one will come and critique me. 
But how many of you have been married and you just don't talk about your problems and they just go away? Anybody that worked for you? It's not worked for me. Carol's like, yeah, that does not work. You're the problem and you're still here. Listen, there's a lost and a dying world out there and they desperately need hope. They need life and they need salvation and freedom. And this is the message of the cross. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are walking to the temple and they, they see a man who is lame and he's begging for money. And I don't know if they'd seen this man before and just walked by him or maybe they'd seen this man before and they'd given him money for all I know. But they see this man this time and they decide to stop. Certainly others had walked by, certainly others had given them money. But I want you to listen to what he says in Acts chapter 3. It says this, Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. I'm going to pause there for a moment. I think a lot of times we don't want people to look at us. Now, what was Peter saying? He wasn't just saying, look at me. He was saying, look at what's inside of me. We have to draw some attention to what's inside of us, who's inside of us. We can't stop and say, look at us, look at my life. I'm not saying it's perfect, but if we can't do that, then we got to take a little bit of inventory so we can get to that point. Because watch what's going to unfold as a result. He says, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Now, what he probably expected was some money. But Peter says this, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Listen, sometimes, church, we are so concerned with what we do not have that we forget what we have is the most important thing that anyone in this life needs. We have Jesus. Verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. See, on the heels of this miracle, the Bible says if you could continue to read on, the crowd was astonished. They were in amazement. And so people are beginning to watch, and Peter turns to address the crowd, and he begins to share about this hope, this healing this man named Jesus that can save them, that can rescue them, that can free them. And the religious leaders, though, at the time, they, they saw what was going on and they didn't like it. Because they had power and they had position. And they said, what you're saying is not lining up with what we want. This was supposed to be our agenda and you're starting this revolution and we want to shut that down. The Bible says that they were greatly disturbed by what Peter and John were saying. So they seized them and they put them in jail problem was they didn't really know what to do with him because they hadn't done anything wrong. And so the religious leaders begin to talk with each other. Acts chapter 4, verse 16. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. Could you imagine, church, if we could be a church that it was undeniable that the love of God existed in this place? No matter how much the media and other people might say the church doesn't care about you, the church doesn't love you, they're a bunch of haters, they're a bunch of this, they're a bunch of that, that we would undeniably live with a heart of love and grace to the world around us. You know how powerful that would be? He says we can't deny it. Verse 17. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them by warn, I think they meant threaten them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I don't think we are necessarily being explicitly told not to speak up as followers of Jesus, but we are being labeled as things that keep us from speaking up as followers of Jesus. And we cannot let people intimidate us from the message of hope that comes through him. Verse 19, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. If you don't pick up on sarcasm, there's a little bit of it right there. They weren't really asking the question. They were just putting it out there. And this is what they say in verse 20. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Church, we must be a church that cannot help but speak about what we have seen and what we have heard of the goodness of God that's been at work in our lives. 
Some of you, you're new to the journey. Some of you, it's been years. But we must tell the story of who Jesus is. You don't have to stand on a pulpit like me, standing up here on a stage and preach a message. But you have a story to tell, and it should not be held to the confines of this room. What did Jesus tell Pilate he was here for? Going all the way back to the beginning. To bear witness to the truth. This should be us as well. Let us bear witness with our voice. Let us bear witness with our life. And this year, let us bear witness to the truth with our vote. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. I know this message is a little bit different. Break away from our, our regular series. But it's important that we understand what it is to live with a kingdom mindset. But maybe you're here today and you say, honestly, Ray, I never even really thought of it that way. I don't even really have a a relationship with Jesus. But I know that what's going on in my life, this can't be it. There's got to be more. I would would be so honored to just take a moment to pray for you today. Today is not. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've not been walking with him this day. I just want to come back into a close relationship with him again. No one else looking Let us honor you. 